the kingdom of God. Again, we hear a gospel full of parables. We've heard this for the last two weeks as we've worked our way through Matthew chapter 13, which is this great, I don't know if you can call it parabolic discourse, but this great discourse of parables. I think parabolic might mean something else here. And we have these two striking parables right at the beginning, both with a similar message but with a slight nuance of difference between them, the treasure buried in the field and the pearl of great price. Like all of Jesus' other parables, there's a riddle character to these. They seem clear at first, like they make sense, no problem, I get it. The kingdom of God is something precious that's worth giving everything. But then the more you start to dig into them and unpack them, the more you see there's something really curious about the kingdom of God here. I think there's two related aspects that I can see. The first is that the kingdom of God is something that you could walk right past and not even realize, like a treasure buried in a field. If you weren't looking for it or accidentally, you know, lay under a tree and hit your head on it and then start to dig at it, you might walk right past it. It's not something that's obvious, at least until we have eyes to see and a heart that desires to look for it. And then there's another aspect to this as well. It's not only is the kingdom of God something that we could walk right past, or that could be with us for a long time and not even realize it. It's also something that when we do see it, we have to have further eyes to see, eyes of faith, because it's not something terribly practical. What do you mean by that, you might ask, right? Because a treasure in a field, if you're able to get it, sounds pretty practical. But dig deeper into this. You see what I did there? Dig deeper, buried treasure. Okay. Think about the pearl, for instance. This merchant who is going out searching for pearls, right? He's got this desire for this thing. He knows what he's looking for, and then he finds it. He sells all that he has to purchase it. Like, what are you going to do with it then? You can't eat it. Like, if we take that literally, he sells all that he has to go out and buy this pearl of great price. What then? What happens after that? It's not a practical decision, even for someone whose lifelong quest is to go and find the greatest of pearls. You can't sell everything you have, just most of your stuff. Otherwise, how are you going to survive? The treasure in the field makes a little bit more sense on those grounds, but it's still, why not just take the treasure? Why go through all of this work of find the treasure, rebury it, or hide it, then go sell all you have and buy that field and then dig it up again? I think the, the riddle character to these, Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God is not something that we can just pick up as we're walking along. It's something that takes a full-on commitment and that takes time as well. Have you ever thought about selling everything that you have to go and purchase something? Like Jesus says this um, as well in the Gospels. Whoever wants to be my disciple, let him go sell all he has and gives to the poor and then take up his cross and come follow me. Like, that's a lot of work. That takes time. You have to actually think about, okay, what do I actually own? And go through all this stuff if you're thinking about it. Somebody who's moved a lot maybe has more experience of this. But it's still the, the kingdom of God, which is this life-giving friendship with Christ. Right? That's what the kingdom of God is. That's not something that we can just idly pick up as we're browsing through a pawn shop or something. Oh, nice, found a pearl. It's something that takes all that we have, that involves a sacrifice on our part, but when we have the eyes to see it for what it really is, it's something that is so clearly worth all of that that like this man who finds the treasure in a field, we do this out of joy. It's not even a question. 
I've talked about my own conversion story a little bit in the past. Um, when I was, I, I grew up Catholic, so it's not like a conversion story like that, but I really, I never saw what I had right in front of me all of those years growing up Catholic, especially when I was a teenager. And then I saw the great good of sleep, and that looked like the pearl of great price. And so I started pushing back and not wanting to go to Mass anymore, and then I eventually won that battle for a little bit and detached myself. And by the time I got to college, I, I never considered myself not Catholic, but I certainly wasn't living my faith in any recognizable way. I didn't have a prayer life. I wasn't living according to the commandments. I wasn't going to church unless I felt like it. And then something happened that first year. I was at University of Dallas in Irving, not far from here. Something happened that first year, and that's, that's for another story, but it opened my eyes. It was this act of grace, of God's grace giving me the eyes to see this incredible treasure that he had been offering me my entire life, and I'd walked past it like it was just a pebble in a creek bed, not recognizing it for the pearl it was. And when I had that realization, the first thing I did was I went to confession, and then just as a natural consequence to discovering this treasure, the rest of my life started to change. I'd been hanging out with a group of friends that was leading me astray, and I was like, well, I guess I have to find new friends. And that sounds like a huge sacrifice to make, right? Like, that can be a major decision, but in this case, it was like, no, I was, I was lost, and now I'm found. I was dead, and now Christ has brought me back to life. It's a no-brainer. And so I found new friends, and they taught me a whole bunch about like going to Mass. I found out I could go to Mass every day, and I'd never known that my whole life, and it just blew my mind. I couldn't stay up all night anymore. I couldn't go to parties. Like Those things didn't feel like sacrifices anymore, not at all, because of the great good that I discovered of this friendship with Christ that had captivated my heart and had set me on this pursuit of him that eventually just took over everything. It led me down some, some interesting paths, like I started dressing kind of dorky for a little while in university. Like, okay, back off that a little bit. But then, I don't know, I became a priest, so I can dress weird all the time now. It's when the kingdom of God, when this grace and friendship this life-transforming experience of Christ's love for us, when we can see that for what it is, it changes everything. And so it's not an exaggeration of this parable for Jesus to say, it's like a man who found a treasure in a field and after he'd buried it, he went out and from his joy, that's how the Greek says it, and out of his joy, out of this abundance of joy, sold all he had to purchase that field. That's this great treasure which Christ offers us in friendship. And that brings me to our practice of this week, which is similar um, to the effect that I discovered when I was in college, how my whole life started to transform once I recognized this great good for what it was, once I had eyes to see what was in front of me. And it's called instituting a rule of life. Now a rule of life, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but I will explain it here. For more details, please go see our Sabbath guide on our website um, and scroll down to the part that says process and it'll explain uh, all of this in much greater detail, but a rule of life is basically just a short-term, uh, shorthand name for everything that I normally do, right? My normal habits, my normal friends, my normal sleep schedule, prayer schedule, all of this. That makes up my rule of life. We all have one even if we don't think intentionally about what's in it. But once we recognize this great good, of the kingdom of God amongst us, this invitation that Christ gives us, 
Once it catches hold of our hearts, then the next step, almost immediately, this is what happened to me, is to start re-examining our rule of life. Start setting up structures in our lives intentionally so that we have time to pray. If friendship with God is this great good, right, we're sacrificing everything, then we need to make time to spend with him each day. And it would be kind of crazy if we didn't. It would be like, okay, good, I found this treasure, I recognized it for what it was, I'm just gonna let it sit there for a while because I don't really have time to deal with it. That's not the response we see in the Gospels here. And so we have to set up and be intentional about it, and it takes some sacrifice, selling all that we have in some sense. Time for prayer every day, but also to live a balanced life. If we don't sleep enough, we're probably not going to be able to stay awake when we try and pray. That's a common experience. If our work is demanding of us in the kind of way which is unsustainable to actually spend time with our families and with God, even things like that need to be reconsidered. And so this title given to everything that we do throughout the day and throughout the weeks and throughout the months, this rule of life, this is something that can be invaluable. And if we feel like we look back into our own lives And at one point we have discovered this great good, this great treasure, and it's affected this change in our lives, but then it's gradually cooled. Examining our rule of life is a way where we can rekindle those fires, where we can give God more room to work in our lives and not crowd him out with so many other things. And the final thing is that This week, we begin what we're calling a five-week homily series. We're calling it The Pursuit, and it's a a homily series on discipleship. Like we did in Lent, all of the topics for this series come right out of the readings. They're not something artificially imposed upon it, but as kind of a thesis running through the readings for the next five weeks, we're seeing that this pursuit of Christ that happens when we come to this realization. It begins with finding the treasure in the field, right? But that it involves a a journey, walking along a pathway. It's not something that happens just like that. There's landmark moments throughout it, but we have to keep going, and we have to keep going together. And so this thesis running throughout these next five readings, I just tell you this so that you can look ahead and prepare. And we're going to be talking about discipleship and this pursuit of Christ, which is the very heart of discipleship throughout these next five weeks. And hopefully we'll see that in our pursuit of him, it's really him who has been pursuing us all along, drawing us by his grace and giving us the eyes to see.